Some of you may remember uh, we had uh, a meeting on this, a lecture and a panel discussion a couple of months ago, um, which was a, a great uh, success and caused a lot of interest so that many of you asked us to have a follow-up discussion um, with mostly time uh, for discussion for people uh, that they could put questions to the panel. And I'm uh, very grateful to our panelists today that they agreed to come together uh, again uh, with some additions to answer your questions. Now, before we start, I just want to briefly run us through um, how this will go today. So first of all, just to let you know that you're all um, muted and not on visual for permissions purposes, and it will stay that way throughout the meeting. After the panelists have introduced themselves and uh, responded to one introductory question, I will ask them. You can submit then a question via email. The email address is uh, will be put into the chat. Uh, my assistant, John Nolan, who is helping me with all of this, will put this in the chat now. Um, and it's basically the Houston Center email address, Houston Center at regent-college.edu. Houston Center at regent-college.edu. And if you write that question in during the uh, during the introductions and while you're thinking of it, could you please, if you so wish, specify to whom the question is to be asked? So with your question, put to whom you want it, whom you want to answer. And uh, when that answer is given, we'll give each panelist a chance to also respond or comment on the question. And I think that's all the preliminaries that we need to observe. We'll draw the meeting to a close uh, at seven as planned. So let us begin, first of all, by welcoming our panelists. I'm really, really grateful that, you, that you're all here. And we will begin by um, just letting you introduce yourselves. And I'm just going to go out of the way that you're on my screen. So Dr. Coddle, if you could start and then We'll go to uh, Neil, then to Andrew, and then to Isabel, please. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Margaret Cottle. I'm a palliative care physician, and I work in home hospice mainly, and I'm here in Vancouver, BC, and I'm a clinical assistant professor at UBC School of Medicine. Thank you, and welcome. Neil. Good, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt Songhees people. Uh, my name is Neil Balanje. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Indigenous Disability Canada and the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. I'm a member of the Laxail clan in the House of Niganane of the Consent for First Nation, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Andrew? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to be with all of you this evening. My name is Father Deacon Andrew Bennett. I am the director of the Faith Communities Program at CARDIS, which is Canada's uh, nonpartisan faith-based think tank in Ottawa. And I am also a deacon in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church for the Eparchy of Toronto and Eastern Canada. Thank you very much. And uh, Isabel. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel Grant. I'm a professor at the Allard School of Law at UBC, specializing in criminal law. And I come to this issue through work with uh, a number of disability organizations, including primarily Inclusion Canada. OK, thank you very much. Um, welcome, all. And uh, to start off with, I've asked um, Dr. Grant to give us a brief history of um, of Canada's euthanasia and made policies, where we originated with this and where we're now with the various tracks or expansions, uh, whatever they're called, uh, so that we're all sort of on the same page as to where the policies are. And then when you've done that, Dr. Grant, if you could um, also add then from your perspective as a, as a lawyer and as a person interested in the in the issue of disability, um, tell us um, what your main concern is and how you think the, the game of um, you know, law and even perhaps in terms of the constitution, what has changed with these uh, continued policy expansions? If you could comment on that as sort of the second part. Sure, and 
I will be as brief as possible. <laughs> Basically, in, in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Carter decision held that it violated the Charter of Rights to have an absolute prohibition on medically assisted deaths. So um, in response to that decision, Parliament enacted Bill C-14 in 2016, which allowed for medical assistance in dying, but only for people whose natural death was reasonably foreseeable. Um, then uh, one trial judge in a Quebec case, and I think it was around 2019, um, said that the, putting that limit on medical assistance in dying in itself violated the charter. And rather than appeal that decision, which would be the normal course of events, um, the federal government decided to expand medical assistance in dying so that you no longer have to be, you no longer have to have a reasonably foreseeable death in order to qualify so long as you have a grievous and irremediable medical condition and that you are suffering either physically or psychologically in a way that you have decided is intolerable to you. And sort of in response to your second question, so that latter part where you do not have a reasonably foreseeable death is what we refer to as track two medical assistance in dying. It has a few additional safeguards that are not present for track one, which is for people for whom their death is reasonably foreseeable. I come at this from the spec perspective of equality for people with disabilities. And um, I think, to be blunt, I think this law is discriminatory. I think it frames ending of life as a form of medical treatment for people who are not themselves at the end of life. And I think that frames disability as in such a way that death is seen as preferable to providing the supports that we should be providing to people with disabilities. And as someone who works extensively on feminist issues and violence against women, I'm particularly concerned about the high rates of um, chronic illness, poverty, et cetera, amongst women. And as Neil can talk about, particularly indigenous women. Um, so I have particular concerns about what track two made will look like uh, moving forward for people with disabilities. Very, um, very good. Thank you for this. You really kept this brilliantly, uh, brilliantly brief, and yet it's all there. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe we can go around with the second part of the question, Dr. Caudle. Um, as a physician, what what do you think, particularly the track to? But I mean, in terms of even the whole development, how has this changed the game? How has this changed um, your 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 field? Well. As a person who's been involved in palliative care almost since the beginning in Canada, I've been a palliative care physician for over 30 years. It's uh, It's been a huge game changer for us. And I made a few notes. I know I've got about three minutes, you said, um, and I thought it would I would be a little more focused if I did that. So what has happened is that we have had a normalization of what I call medical termination because I've been doing medical assistance in dying for 30 some years and I've never taken anyone's life. So the Dutch call it medical termination. And for me, that's a, a much more um, descriptive term. Hmm. Um, the other things that have happened, so we've had this normalization across all, all sectors uh, that as, as uh, Professor Grant was saying that death is a reasonable, response to suffering of any type. I've seen also a, a huge increase of anxiety and confusion among staff members, uh, patients, and families. I thought you were not going to hasten death, and now the it's been thrown into palliative care, and what, what is really happening here? And when people are already upset, that has made things even worse. I've seen a decrease in the in creative curiosity about why people would want this. And one of the gold standards of palliative care is that we dig when somebody says, I don't want to be alive anymore. I wish I were dead. We don't say, oh, I'll call the maid team. We say, how can we come alongside you? How can we be with you? And that's been, um, been very frowned upon. And people have uh, ended up with complaints from the college and being bullied by uh, 
administrators if they don't just immediately go for May, uh, encourage MAID. It's also caused a decrease um, in the diversity of the workforce of people who are doing this because those who um, have conscience, ob conscience objections, conscientious objections to being involved in this are being pushed out or are choosing not to go into, into this uh, field. Um, it's also caused, in my opinion, uh, it, we've had a, a furtherance of the emphasis in Canada of rights over love. And Ian Benson once said that rights are uh, an admission that love has failed. So if we all cared for one another so, and looked out for each other's rights, we wouldn't really need to, to have rights. <laughs> but you know, we do live in a difficult world and we need to have rights. I'm not saying that they're, that they're wrong, but love is better. Uh, that's the most excellent way that Paul was talking about. And to say that we have to have these rights and that we're, we're celebrating these rights, to me, is a sad thing um, mm -hmm. over caring. And the last thing that I would say is that we have impoverished our society and our families and our culture because we've, we've exchanged the true gold that's refined by fire of caring for each other, even when it's hard for the little gold plastic trinket in the Cracker Jack box of autonomy. And that has been um, a real loss for, for us, a loss for our children, a loss for our grandchildren, and um, a real hit to our metaphysical environment. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for that. I'm, I really have to restrain myself not to enter into the, because you've raised all these really important metaphysical uh, questions and definitions, you know, what what is autonomy? How are we thinking about the self? Why, why is this dis, even this disconnect of love and rights that shouldn't be? Um, but I I will just uh, stomp on my philosophical uh, mind and and um, and move on to uh, uh, Neil. If you could uh, answer the same kind of perspective uh, question from your perspective. Thanks, Jens. And for us, for our organization, I would say. We're not an advocacy organization, we're a service provider. And so hmm. we, we provide direct services to uh, indigenous individuals and families with disabilities. Um, so we were never really in the business of advocacy on a, on a large level when it came to MAID. But however, MAID was so uh, phenomenally targeting, you know, persons with disabilities under track two, not at end of life. Uh, we could sit back because we serve thousands of individuals each year. And, and over the years, uh, 99. 9% of those individuals and families live in poverty. We have 635 First Nations communities across Canada, 53 Inuit communities, numerous chartered Métis communities. Poverty is a, a huge factor in the lives of many. Uh, the frequency of disability within the Indigenous population is significantly higher than that of the non-Indigenous population. And we deal with the added bonuses of anti-Indigenous racism within healthcare systems, ableism, and discrimination. So for us as an organization in our board, looking at this and looking at the direction that the government had taken, and I appreciate the, what Dr. Connell and Professor uh, Grant has said, you know, when it comes to the equality right in Canada, everyone is truly equal, except some are more equal than others. And that's the problem. There is no equality here in Canada. So when we start putting in uh, legislation as a law that target a specific group that did not have equality to the other group, and these laws were were crafted by largely non-racialized people that come from from wealth and that you know uh, as one of our colleagues said during the last uh, last meeting uh, that we had at UBC that they've had total control and direction over their life and now they want total control and direction over their death the unfortunate aspect from us for traffic too is disability in Canada indigenous disability has never been a priority and we, and we just need to look at provincial and territorial disability assistance rates to see what people are getting the supports that they're getting and see how woefully low they are um, and so we, we've worked on this and we've worked with uh, with uh, Professor Grant and Inclusion Canada and other areas to try to advance and raise awareness of this um, and we've seen that you know the pro may groups um, and even the uh, when it went to the special committee on, on medical assistance and dying you know it was a stacked deck uh, the senators and, and members of parliament there were very pro made and, and the witnesses that had concerns about made were treated differently than those witnesses that did not have concerns. Um, so we knew the answer in the expansion was going forward. The three special reports that have been released, every report said,
said, there had been no consultation with indigenous communities on made, not zero whatsoever. They all recommended there should be. This flies in kind of the face of, uh, of UNDRA, of the CRPD, but yet knowing this, admitting this, government committees, they push it forward to expand and expand during the last recommendations was to expand under track one for mature minors. And we don't know what that means, uh, but we do know that in advanced directives, uh, but we do know that once something ex is expanded under track one, it will be put into track two. So for our communities, indigenous children with disabilities dealing with mental illness, you know, uh, we had mental illness as a school condition being uh, approved and then delayed uh, because of kind of the outcry from the community as well. But we know these things are coming. And alarmingly, when we look at, you know, track one, the, the language says that, you know, the parents should be involved, but it'll be the decision of the of the mature minor about how it goes forward. So a lot of the things that have come up, and I know I'm rambling on here, a lot of the things that have come up, you know, during testimony committee concerns that we have said, and, you know, if we ever say the slippery slope, then, you know, probing groups jump on and say, oh, that's just, a, you know, not true. It's just a thing. Everything that we predicted would, that would happen when we raised concerns back in 2016 has happened. And, and, and the expansion continues. And, and even the narrative from the primary groups where it was, no oh, one in poverty, not at end of life would be granted me because they live in poverty. Even their narrative has changed to, well, yeah, sure, they live in poverty, but why should they have mates? We come back to that equality, right? So they're, they're shifting as, as public discourse comes out. They're trying to address the, the, the things that we identified a long time ago to now suit their argument. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult world that we live in. Uh, you know, for persons with disabilities, Indigenous people with disabilities, it's a, it's a tough road and there's a lot of work ahead. I won't go on any further, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just add one one detail to that. And yeah, go ahead. Yusama. The way that has happened is we started in 2016 with a number of safeguards. And those safeguards have somehow been transformed into barriers to access. So we've gotten rid of the safeguard of a reasonably foreseeable natural death. We've gotten rid of the waiting period for track one. We have a joint committee. Um, recommending that we get rid of the requirement that you have to be able to consent to safeguard. We've got a recommendation, consent to healthcare. We've got a recommendation that now it should be for minors. So every single safeguard is under attack and they have been whittled away um, and they are now just portrayed as barriers to access. Yeah, no, thanks for this. One yeah, go ahead, Neil. That. And one of the safeguards, of course, is you're supposed to have two independent uh, physicians to be able to determine eligibility. And, and I could get 520 physicians saying I'm ineligible, but if I could find two, those 520, their 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 assessments would not count. I just have to find two, so that promotes you can shop around. And at some point, you will find somebody that will agree with you, whether it's because of you know, uh, they, they feel sympathetic, maybe your life should end because of your poverty, anti-Indigenous racism, all these factors that will intersect to help, you know, form their opinion. And they might think they're doing it because it's, a good, it's the right thing to do, but that's another safeguard and having two, which is not really a safeguard at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for these additions. I mean, that's obviously a question forming, I think in most people's mind, um, which we probably ought to formulate as to why uh, this kind of um, expansionist mentality is there. Like, is it systemic? Is it because, as Neil just said, is it because they think they're doing a good thing? Um, or, or why? Um, but before we maybe get there, let let uh, 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 Father Deacon Andrew Bennett, could you add your perspective to this question? Thanks very much, Jens, and thank you to uh, my colleagues for their their perspectives as well. Um, at the core of this, from my perspective, as someone who uh, obviously on theological questions, but also as someone who works on um, the broader questions around conscience, uh, human dignity, and so forth. At the core of the entire debate over euthanasia and assisted suicide is uh, an anthropological problem. And that anthropological problem is a, uh, a disordered anthropology that our present society has fully embraced. And it's an anthropology and understanding of the human person that is predicated on a human being's ability to lose their dignity. And that is a very disordered understanding of dignity. You cannot lose your dignity as a human person. Even someone who is suffering gravely still retains their dignity. However, we have 
equaled uh, dignity with productivity, economic productivity, intellectual productivity, physical productivity. And so when that becomes your, your measure for dignity, it's no wonder that uh, people become convinced that they lose their dignity when they are no longer of use, of use to society, of use to themselves, their families. And that's a very pernicious uh, understanding, false understanding of the human person and who the human person is. So we have to challenge this anthropological, this false, false anthropology head on and say that that is not who we are. And we have to remember that before the Carter decision, to assist in someone's suicide was an indictable offense and was seen as being you know, roughly equivalent to murder. And it still is murder. It is homicide. And we have to stop using euphemisms that lie to people. Um, so we have to we have to be very clear on our terms. Euthanasia, medical assisted suicide is killing the patient. That is the end. The end is killing the patient. Um, palliative care, the end is not to kill the patient. The end is to provide uh, palliation that allows the person to die a natural death whenever that death is to come. So uh, it's a question of ends. And that is something that we have to draw a distinction between. And we have to be very clear on that. Um, so there, there, there is a disordered anthropology that is based on this idea that the human person only has value, only has dignity when they are of use, when they are productive, um, versus an anthropology where you maintain that dignity because you're created in the image and likeness of God. Suffering is hard. And there's no, there's no question about that. We can't dismiss suffering. Suffering is very hard. And grave suffering is particularly hard, especially when we see it in someone whom we love, especially when we see it in a child. But now, instead of understanding suffering in its proper context, we see suffering rather as inconvenient. And it's something that has to be dispensed with as quickly as possible. And so when we do that, we basically take away opportunities for community to build around the person that is suffering. And that's what, that's what Margaret was saying. Communities of love that gather around the person who is suffering so that virtues of perseverance, of courage, of love, um, of justice, of mercy can flourish. When you cut that off with euthanasia or assisted suicide, that is a breaking of community. And frankly, the fact that we have come to this point in our country that we are actively advocating euthanasia and assisted suicide as forms of medical treatment demonstrates to me a fundamental breakdown in community, in human community in this country. We're not willing to step out and to minister to someone who is suffering in a way that recognizes that true dignity. So um, from a Christian perspective, I would say that Christians now, as Christians have throughout their history, along with people of goodwill from other faith groups and people of no faith who reject euthanasia and assisted suicide, we must be able to offer to Canadians new healthcare, <clears throat> new healthcare institutions, whether it's through hospice care, other forms of institutions where palliative care can be, can be offered, but even more broadly than that, any form of institution, healthcare institution that rejects a culture of death, and instead embraces a culture of genuine life where we recognize the ongoing and persistence of dignity in the human person right to the moment of death. Thank you, um, Brother Andrew Bennett. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, use my privilege here for one second and ask this question, which is this, um, which was on my mind since we had our first meeting. Uh, when when Neil already uh, said this about the stacked deck, and I remember um, uh, Will Johnson said something very similar. He sounded very discouraged, very uh, almost cynical um, for people who were asking. So, what can we do? How do we, uh, you know, how do we speak up? To whom we talk? To um, to our representatives, or whatever. And it sounded as if there is almost this concerted will in government and policymakers to. Uh, to go toward the direction of expansion, to endorse the, you know, um, this pathological anthropology. And I know there are all, probably all kinds of uh, ideational, um, you know, tectonic shifts that happen in our society, philosophically, metaphysically, anthropologically, that come to play here. But is there, is there anything 
just systemic or how do you explain each of you to you this this the sense that you're talking against the stack deck that there is the, the critical voice is not allowed actual traction um when when you speak to when you make depositions before you know bodies of government and so on isabel i know has you have experience with this so maybe i can start with you isabel can you well, maybe I'll just say as a law <laughs> professor, I testify quite often before yeah. Senate committees and, and House committees, and I'm always treated very respectfully, unless I'm talking about this issue. When you talk about this issue, you are treated with real disrespect, because I think, as Neil suggested, they really have stacked the deck. They have some of the, the most active made pro proponents that they can find both from the Senate and the House. Um, on those committees. So it really does feel feel like we are fighting an uphill battle. Um, just, you know, I think Inclusion Canada made a video of some of the testimony. Our witnesses were diminished, um, were yelled at, were discredited, um, you know, disabled Canadians who made a lot of effort to go to Ottawa to testify were criticized and, and diminished. It's It's been extremely demoralizing. And and I guess I want to say just sort of in response to the question about rights is that there are rights on both sides of this debate. And we've heard all about the right to die at any moment that you want. Um, the Quebec court said that a disabled person should have a right to die at any moment in their lifetime. Um, but there are rights on the other side, and that is the right to, to live. And, and certainly we will be arguing when this issue gets to court, we will be arguing that that this law hurts every disabled Canadian, not just those who are accessing MAID, but that it hurts everyone who is now constantly having to reassess their own struggles in the context of a society that is offering them death, but not offering them the supports they need to live. Mm, thank you. Dr. Cotton, where do you, where do you think this, this, this will it's, it almost seems like there's a collected will to choose those people who actively promote this to put that yeah. forward. Where does that come from? Well, I think if you once as a society, you decide that death is a solution to suffering, then you, you go there. And for when those of us who have been caring for dying patients for years and years said, uh, in terms of when the legislation and when the court case was coming, we said that this is going to be something that will be uh, become a, a duty and become normalized. People scoffed at us. People scoffed at us. And I think this idea, that one, one person, I'll give you an example. One person from my professions asked the question at one of our big palliative care meetings. And he said, is the reason that we're having such a push for hasten death right now, is it because we haven't taught our learners, those who are learning to be caregivers and doctors, et cetera, we haven't taught our learners how to be radically present with those who are suffering in ways that are safe, both for the learner and for the patient. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we've heard across the board from the panelists is that there is this idea that it's we don't want to think about it. We don't want to think about death. We we want to get death before death gets us. We have this illusion of control, uh, and and that in in Oregon the the saying was when they 25 years ago when they legalized assisted suicide, the the folks who were fighting it said that the main people who were in favor of it were white wealthy well and worried. And I think that certainly has been, for the most part, the case in Canada. It hasn't been completely that way, but there is, I think there's a part of people, every person who, as Jay Budzieszewski would say, um, that what we can't not know. And there's a part of every person who realizes that it's not a good idea for one person to kill another person. And when we make this normal in our society, there is a push for everybody to have to be involved. And so in a way, 
you don't want to have somebody like the Delta Hospice Society, where they are only hospice in all of Fraser Health that was not providing, uh, was not actually providing medical termination. And the government revoked all the contracts and was taken away from them the ability to care for people in, in a hospice because they refused to do that. Although they could have gone half a block away to the hospital next door and gotten it. So there's this idea that everybody has to be involved because I have to have that affirmation that this is a societal good. And I think that's, that's part of it. So to be honest, I think the question is not so much why and how we got here, um, you know, a la Carl Truman and some of those other things, not so much that as, okay, this is where we are. What do we do now? How do we go about uh, being different? How do we go about being lights at, in shining like stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? How do we go about caring for our neighbors, caring for our own loved ones, caring for the elders in our community, caring for those around us who uh, live in marginalized communities and um, still keeping the government's feet to the fire? There was a whole group of very disparate organizations, everything from the Christian Medical uh, and Dental Association to disability rights groups and everything that came together under Michael Bach and Catherine Frazee's direction to put forward something called the vulnerable person standard to say, okay, if you're going to do this, this is the way we can make it as safe as possible for vulnerable people. And the Trudeau government wanted nothing to do with it, even though it was endorsed by uh, you know, hundreds of groups it representing thousands and thousands of people. So there's just been a, an actual chosen blindness about this. And it, it's been pretty horrible the way that world experts in palliative care have been demeaned. Disability rights advocates, people living with disabilities have been demeaned. It's uh, anybody who has any sort of a faith base has been demeaned in front of these co committees and their, their, um, their testimony discounted. So it's uh, even, even the government experts that, that have been hired by the government have been discounted if it doesn't follow the narrative that, um, that the, uh, the white worried well and wealthy are wanting to have. Um, wow, thank you so much. And Neil, can you, um, the chosen blindness is, a, is an interesting phrase, right? I mean, you choose to be blind because you have another vision. Um, Neil, what do you, what do you, when you said that the deck is stacked, like you must have pondered this. What, um, what, what do you think about that? Well, I, it, and I think Isabel touched on it too. And if you ever want to look, go to, to look at that video from Inclusion Canada. And uh, well, I, and I guess when we're looking at this, and when when I testified to the Abbott committee, and and of course, uh, you know, experienced the same thing, and, and and when I expressed my concern about the expansion of aid. Um, you know, the next question from from one of the senators was from somebody, uh, someone who practices euthanasia in one of the Benelux countries, and promoted that vision. And oh, did you ever see this here? But we're not we're not the same countries. Different histories, different different set of everything's different. But one thing to remember, if we want to talk about you know that that committee itself, while that committee was examining different. Uh, portions of Maine, such as uh, mental illness as a sole condition, mature minors, and advanced directives, one of the senators of that committee actually put a public member bill forward on advanced directives. During the same time, that committee was supposed to be looking at whether or not they should be considering advanced directives. So nothing was done. The chair people, chairpersons didn't step in and say, well, that's just ridiculous. Why are you doing that? It just went forward. We, we were aghast by that, thinking, well, what's going on here? So, and I think, I, I think, you know, the, the white wealthy, uh, we call it white, white, white wealthy wouldn't want to be you, uh, is, 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 is more uh, descriptive. Uh, I think that's exactly it. When they did the consultations, and you'll see 
you'll see the government talk about, wow, you know, we did the online survey and 300,000 people responded and it was to the majority why they do this. Well, they didn't, they didn't uh, you know, have the survey accessible to persons with disabilities in remote communities. A lot of people didn't know what it was, what was going on or what it was doing. Um, and so I think that part of it as well is, I think it is that loss of community in some aspects. I think it is that loss of, uh, of uh, connection and, and, and faith and spirituality. Uh, but I think people, like I said in the beginning, Beginning, they want to have control of their own destiny. And I think that if you walked up or went up to anybody and you said, should I have the right to die? They may never want to exercise that right, but they want that option. So to preserve their option that they can make that decision, although they may never exercise it, they'd say, yes, I'm in favor of that. You know, or as Isabel noted, you know, if they see somebody using a wheelchair <clears throat> or a person with a disability, they said, well, I, I, then that's where the wouldn't want to be you comes in. I can't imagine living my life that way. I can't imagine that I would have a good productive, fulfilling life if I live with a disability. So absolutely, I never want to get to that state. You know, if I had to use a TENS, like we've heard people uh, talk about, you know, people that use adult briefs saying, oh, that's just, you know, who would want to be that? Or may drool when they're eating, saying, you know, those are things that take away your dignity. Like uh, like uh, Andrew had said, well, that's nothing further from the truth. That's just who they are as people. It's part of who they are. Their disability is part of who they are. It's, it, it's not a uh, something that would warrant someone euthanizing them or even considering it because that may not be acceptable to them. But these are the biases that we see and these are the, the concept, concepts we see. But I really think for, for a great many people, they want that option. They may never want to execute that option, but they want, they want the security that I think it brings them to think, you know, I have that out if I want it, rather than say, you know what? properly fund palliative care, make sure that all the resources are available, make sure that the individual and the family are comfortable, surround them with loved ones, with their community, and make that transition something that's, you know, uh, better than an injection or, uh, or a lethal, uh, you know, a sedative or whatever it is. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how we've progressed and, and, and using other countries as a benchmark for us is uh, when they're not us, don't have our history, it's, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, this is really interesting. So what emerges then is that we have a government uh, so fully in the grip of the kind of pathological concept of autonomy or anthropology that, that Father Deacon uh, Bennett, Andrew Bennett has, uh, has delineated, that they would even in their policy stack the decks so that the other Canadians that have a different view or speak out from that view against, they're simply silenced, they're censored and not listened to. Uh, so the question arises then again, what what can we what can we do? But I, I, um, Brother Bennett, I'll let you have the last word in this question before we open it up to the uh, to the audience for questions. Just before, oh, yes. Andrew, um, I just wanted to say that it goes beyond silencing and not paying attention. It it goes to bullying and uh, saying. Uh, <clears throat> personal attacks, all that sort of thing. It goes way beyond just not paying attention to you. You know, yeah. I've been told, well, the reason that you're in palliative care is you must, and you don't want this to happen is you enjoy watching people suffer. So, you know, that type of thing for someone who has been a physician for as long as I have and dedicated my life to caring for people, if, if I were in any other area, nobody would put up with that. But, you know, people applaud when they say when people say that to me. So it, it goes way beyond just not paying attention to attack and and demoralizing and trying to deplatform uh, people that have these views. Yeah, well, it's very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So that to that point, I mean, the attacking uh, the arrogance of such people, of legislators on committees. Well, we have to look at this through a spiritual lens. Um, those attacks, that arrogance, belies what they know in their deep conscience. And this is something that that you referenced, um, you know, Margaret, about, about uh, you mentioned Jake Budzeshevsky. Um, they know in their deep conscience that this is evil. So they cannot brook any opposition that pricks their conscience. So when they hear the opposition, it pricks their conscience, and so they react strongly and uh, inappropriately. I think also the challenge that we have beyond simply the anthropology, and uh, I'd be interested to have, interested to have Isabel's view on this, is that 
Canada and, and Canadians have passively accepted uh, a particular type of legal positivism, which is based on the idea that, well, if it's legal, it must be true. If there's legislation in place that says one thing, well, that must be true. Well, there's nothing further from the truth. Just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's true or good or, or, or just. It's legal, I'll grant you that, but it's not true. And so um, we have to reject that because, uh, you know, certainly in the Christian tradition and other, and other traditions, if something violates the moral law so uh, persistently and in such a grave way as, uh, you know, the, the next wave of euthanasia legislation is going to, then we must absolutely oppose it. Um, certainly, as, as, a, as a Christian, all Christians must oppose it and have no participation in it whatsoever. Um, just because people want this, and we talk about the white, the worried, and so forth, just because people want something doesn't mean it's good for them. That's a very basic ethical principle. Uh, you know, um, you might, you might, you know, like a particular, you might want to have a you know, fifth whiskey. That's not good for you. And I'm sorry, euthanasia is not good for you. It, it, is, it is destructive, and it destroys relationships. And as I said, it destroys community. And so we have to, um, those of us that are committed to palliative care, those of us that are committed to, I'll use the word, I can't believe I'm saying it, but choice, the word pro-choice, when it comes to end-of-life care, then we have to be very strong and, pre and present options. And sometimes those options might require civil disobedience um, because that's where we're at. And there are gonna be people in our communities that want us to come forward with those solutions, that want us to offer palliative care. And it might mean that we have to, you know, adopt a whole new approach to, to uh, philanthropy and, and charity, uh, to build up these institutions and do them outside of the current system. But I can tell you, there are a lot of people that are going to want to be sure that when they go uh, to a place to, to die, that their doctor is not going to kill them. And so I think there's, there's a huge opportunity here to create new institutions in our country that challenge the current uh, culture of death. Isabel, can I just get your, your quick response to, I mean, I can't resist if, if Andrew put this out there on, on, the, uh, on law versus truth. Um, I mean, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. I'm not gonna make a grand pronouncement about <laughs> criminal law, but I mean, there is just one detail that I wanted to mention because I don't think a lot of people really get this. We have decriminalized murder. There is a specific provision in the law that says it will not be murder if it's made, but in for people with disabilities only. And I, I just think we have to really, really question how we can live in a country that says it's okay to kill people who are disabled if they want you to kill them. There is another provision in the law, and I am someone who sort of, you know, returns to the law that says you can't consent to have yourself killed. That is, we don't recognize it if you consent to have yourself killed. Um, so there's all these kind of confusing inconsistencies in the law. And I just have to mention that the government is also saving hundreds of millions of dollars in healthcare costs through this legislation. Now, I'm not saying that's their sole or even their primary motivation, but it is a fact that it made saves them hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes, and the argument has been made, has been put forward in a, in a report, I recall. And I, 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 even then I thought, man, if, we're, if we've gone that far already that this is actually put forward as an argument, uh, that's, that's pretty low. Um, anyway, it's, it's high time that we, uh, open this up to questions. Could I, John, could I get you to um, read questions and prioritize those um, directed to uh, Dr. Grant, if there are any, because Dr. Grant has graciously uh, come on board here knowing that she has a, another important meeting to attend to, so she has to leave early. So any questions to her, if we sure. could uh, put those first, thank you. Yep, and uh, to everybody participating, I'm gonna send out the email address to which you can submit your questions one more time. And as Yen said at the beginning of the call, please specify to whom your question uh, is addressed. Um, so that should that should do it for now. Um, Dr. Grant, 
the question is, is the pressure on medical practitioners itself a violation of both the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as a violation of the very oath, do no harm, uh, which apparently medical students are still being asked to say? Maybe I'll defer to Dr. Caudill on the Hippocratic Oath, but I'll, I'll just say, um, I think there are conscience rights and that's guaranteed by the Charter of Rights too, that, that physicians cannot be um, forced to provide, a I mean, I hesitate to call it a treatment because I think that's a fundamental um, misnomer that it's not a treatment. But, but I think one of the issues that's, that's really gonna come down to is whether doctors have to refer. So if I, as a doctor, um, I'm not comfortable administering death to this person, do I have to send them to somebody who is? And there is a lot of money and a lot of activism going on to make sure that, that, that you do. Um, and that there's a move in Ontario, you know, to require physicians to refer. So I'll refer that, the rest of that question to Dr. Cottle about the Hippocratic Oath. Well, first of all, most medical schools do not require uh, the Hippocratic Oath to be said. And if they do, they do a quote unquote modern version or a very watered down version. And there's not, they're not required to participate. Um, in terms of the conscience protection, that it, it, it's non-existent really, despite what the law says. The, in, for a number of years now in Ontario, you, you could lose your license if you refuse to make what's called an effective referral. And also there's a couple other provinces as well to make an effective referral. So uh, a, a group of physicians, five very brave physicians took uh, this conscience uh, problem with it. They said that anything was legal, anything that was legal, you had to make an effective referral if you didn't want to do it yourself or whatever. And they took it as far as the Ontario Supreme Court. The Ontario Supreme Court actually ruled and said, yes, it is, a, it, it is against your, your rights, but the, the patient, what the patient wants trumps everything. So we did not appeal it beyond that to the Supreme Court because we didn't want the infection to go all the way across Canada. So um, it's, it, it, it's the conscience protection for physicians is, is very tenuous. Um, and in fact, in Ontario, they're trying to make it, not only do you have to make a referral, but you have to follow up and say that, ask the person if the person got connected, which you never have to do if you're making a referral to an orthopedic surgeon or whatever. And my, my very cynical ophthalmologist husband says, are you supposed to call them up and say, are you dead yet? You know, it's just, uh, it, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of ridiculous as to what, what they're asking about that. And the, the place where the coal front on this, the coal face on this is that those who are championing medical termination are now saying that physicians should be required to list medical termination as a treatment for any condition where the, the, the person might qualify. <clears throat> so this is pretty, and, and you would in the, the provinces that require that you make an effective referral, you wouldn't have a way out of that if they decided. So every time a cancer diagnosis is made or something serious, there's, there's really almost no diagnosis at the moment that, that can't be twisted by somebody to, to do this. And um, lest people think that, we're, that the folks who are talking about people living with disabilities are overstating the case, when you look at why people are asking for medical termination, it's all about disability, whether it's long-term disability or disability that's come with an illness or an accident or whatever, it's all about the disability. It's not about pain. It's about suffering of an existential kind about control and about disability, which has shattered their illusion of control. So yes, it's a huge issue. And uh, we are about to have have a chance where we don't we don't have doctors who have consciences anymore. In fact, uh, an article was published that by one of the journals of medical ethics. It said that they, that advocated by a, one of the authors was a Canadian bioethicist by the name of Udo Schuchling, and they said that no 
student should be admitted to medical school unless he or she was willing to do everything that was legal in Canada. And it was, you know, kind of people pushed back at it, but that that's out there in the public that if you want to be a, a dermatologist, fine, but you have to be willing to do abortions or medical terminations. Um, it, that, that's where we're headed because there's, there's this group think about, and as soon as students get into medical school, they are being basically, in my opinion, indoctrinated about the correct way to think about these issues. Do we have any, um, do any of you want to comment on this? Or should we, we can, we have lots of questions coming in. Okay, let's just go to the next question, John. Sure. Um, this one is for, for you, Neil, um, but I think a number of people on the panel could, could speak to this. Considering the removal of safeguards and the expansion to th track three made options, e.g. severe mental health conditions, mature minors, could we be on our way to a eugenic society? Um, and I know that's a stark question, but I think it's one that's important to discuss. Well, I think we're on that path right now, for sure. Uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, looking at disability, I, it comes back to, to, to exactly that. You know, we wouldn't want to be this. People with disabilities don't have that quality of life. What are they, like Andrew said, what are they contributing? Do they really contribute? You know, they're uh, useless eaters, you know, so it's probably better and more merciful to to take a look. So this is a more compassionate way to deal with them, is to give them a, a, a death with dignity, uh, you know, uh, to, to get out of here. So abs absolutely, I mean, um, I don't think it was designed that way. I don't think that was the intent of government, uh, like Isabel has said, but are we on that way? Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, we have people that are that are uh, have taken made or electing to take made who live with disabilities because they can't get the proper supports in place for them, uh, supports that we could provide but we choose not to, and are presenting made as an acceptable alternative to providing those supports. And again, because of their disability. So, do I think that's happening? Absolutely. Do I do I think that was the original intent of made? Absolutely not, uh, but that's the track that we're on. That's the path that we're, we're traveling. It, I mean, it should come as no surprise that in, in Western society, highly affluent, uh, comfortable, um, you know, where the image of the, of the human person is one of strength, is one of beauty, is one of intelligence, that anything that cuts against that is seen as being a bit hard to take and inconvenient. It doesn't match with what our popular culture presents as the ideal human being. And this has taken various forms throughout human history. Uh, you know, speaking about eugenics, we just need to go back to the 1930s and, and Germany and see what was the ideal human being. And I'm not overstating that. So we have to be very, very careful about the message that we give to people, especially when we're raising children, when we're putting them in through, through public education, what they present, what they see as being um, a human person. And so when you, when you remove from our midst those who are disabled, those who are suffering and near death, those that have um, you know, a particular uh, mental, you know, mental handicap, mental disability, when you remove those from society, that deprives us of the richness that those people bring. Because we can't, because of the way we understand the human person now, we're now increasingly hard, unable to see that richness. And that's very grave. And it robs us of opportunities for solidarity. It robs us of opportunities to show genuine compassion and love. And I mean, in the whole discussion about euthanasia, just to repeat what Margaret said, in the whole discussion about euthanasia, there is no discussion about love. Love is never mentioned. Hope is never mentioned. Joy is never mentioned. And these are all things that we as human beings need in order to be fully human. And, and these, these conversations have to take place in the, in the public debate. Um, we are looking uh, at euthanasia through a purely clinical lens. And that is not the entirety of the human person. I mean, it's a very, very small part. <laughs> and so we have to have the conversation and we need to be listening to theologians. We need to be listening uh, to artists, to, to people that are 
I mean, it's just it's it's just so tragic that we can't see what we are doing. It's just blindly walking um, towards the destruction of our own selves. It's that grave. Maybe, Maybe I'll just, I'll just oh, add sorry. to sorry one detail, and that is that if you look at the history of eugenics in Canada, you know, of which sterilization of Indigenous and disabled women is a significant part, it often starts around best interests of the person that you are eliminating or get, you know, preventing from reproducing. So I, I think I'll say straight out that I think we are already um, practicing eugenics in the name of care. The only other thing that I would add is, and I forgot that, you know, during during the uh, the committee, the testimony, we saw a physician from Quebec, from the Quebec College of Surgeons, openly saying that that MAID should be available to children with disabilities up to one year of age, you know, uh, to utilize MAID, uh, to, to, to parents be able to do, to provide MAID for them up to one year of age, you know, if, if the parents decided this was a good option to do. And he testified to that at the, at their, at, and it seems to be a position so so yes and we've already been doing it for years uh prenatally um and the way I, I was just dismayed that iceland was celebrating the fact that they have they've eliminated down syndrome in their country well, they didn't eliminate down syndrome they just eliminated anybody who had an extra chromosome one chromosome 23 so it, it but if that's the way that we're thinking about these things yes quite definitely this this has this idea that somehow you have to uh in order to be have your life worth living you have to adhere to some sort of a norm uh interestingly they did a study with um, emergency room physicians and 75 percent okay. of the emergency room physicians cannot imagine themselves living with a disability so how do you think people who are living with disabilities are going to be treated when they come to an emergency room? The same thing with people who are part of a marginalized population. It's the same sort of thing that, that we've been hearing over and over. Um, and I went and spoke to my member of parliament and I said, I felt that it was really sad that we had come to the place in Canada where we actually agreed that our, our laws said that there were some lives that were not worth living. And she's a big supporter of all the legislation. And she said, oh, I totally disagree with that. That's not what I believe. And I said, well, you may think you disagree with it, but if the government is passing laws to take it out of murder, is giving money so that people can go and do it, is regulating it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then, but you would do that for a 25 year old young man whose fiance just dumped him, then you you have this double standard for for who do you provide care and for whom do you provide um, you provide death. And so you know she just she couldn't see that. So this is part of what I would say is that is that systemic blindness, really. And at the end of the whole thing, oh my gosh, she thought she was giving me, um, a compliment. And she said, Oh, Dr. Cottle, I really wish that there were more people like you who could take care of these people at the end of life. But our doctors are retiring quite frequently, and we just don't have the resources to do it. So what she's saying is, we are not willing in our society to put enough funds into the system so that we can care for people as they need to be cared for, whether they're living with a disability, whether they're at the end of life, whatever, we'll pay $8 million to somebody to chase a puck around the ice, but we won't pay anything to, to help people at home. And it's, it's not just, it, it's all of us suffer when this happens. You know, I've gone to homes where all the person really needs is a little more care at home and my hands are tied. The person is asking for that because they don't want to have to um, go into uh, a, a nursing home where the care is really bad uh, in, in some of the nursing homes. So I guess I would just say too, this idea about death with dignity. Dignity, in my, in my opinion, is inherent. We have it because we're created in the image of God. However, not everybody always feels dignified. So if a person has lost the, the concept of being dignified, that's not that person's problem. It's our problem. 
It's us in the society to come alongside them and say, what can we do to help you to reframe hope, to know that you're loved, to be cared for in ways that will, will bring life to you, even if you only have a short time. And I think that's where we have to do that. And, and Dr. Harvey Max Chachanoff's uh, excellent work on dignity conserving care over the last 30 years has really given us some signposts of ways to do that. But I won't, I won't go into it now, but it, there's a difference between feeling dignified and having inherent dignity. And it's on us if, if our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones don't feel dignified. And even the people who are marginalized in our community don't feel dignified. We are not to be the people who pass by on the other side. We have the privilege of coming alongside and having that gold refined by fire and being the one who, who comes alongside and, and, and does the most excellent thing in love. If I could just uh, turn to Dr. Grant, if, if, if I'm correct, you have to leave pretty soon, yes? I have about five more minutes. Okay, can I just get you to um, sort of have a last word then um, be before you leave? Like um, maybe, uh, maybe just- Maybe I'll just ask John if there were any other questions that yes. you want- Sure, yeah. And I, I think it would be great to hear from the rest of the panel <laughs> on this as well, but particularly in a legal register for you, Professor Grant, um, some of our audience members have expressed some um, frustration over the sort of lack of impact that some of their own um, um, protests to these policy developments have, have yielded. People have mentioned that they've, you know, sent letters um, to various authorities with no, um, no response or no um, meaningful impact to be seen. Um, so in addition to your final word, um, might you just speak briefly to something that Dr. Cottle has brought up? What can people do at the, at the legal level? Um, given where we are now and given where we'd like to head? I mean, I wish I had a good answer. I hate to leave with such a kind of <laughs> despondent answer to something. But, you know, I mean, there will be constitutional challenges to this law happening. People can contact disability organizations that are investing a lot of time and a lot of free labor from lawyers and, and other experts, doctors, palliative care experts, trying to, to challenge these laws. But that's, that's a real long shot. I would say don't give up. I would say vote, vote, you know, and, and express your, continue to express your concern to your parliamentarians. Um, I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry. You know, I, I come back to Andrew's point about you know, at some point it may require civil disobedience. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank everyone. And I was going to say, if anyone's interested in, you know, learning more about any of these issues, I'd be happy to, to chat further. But thanks very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. I really appreciate you coming on. I, every time we do this, I get such a profound sense of um, uh, gratitude for all of you because of, you know, how deeply immersed you've been in this for so long. Uh, the profundity of the issue and that this needs to be more, um, n not just more talk, but more education on this so that maybe more people get uh, get energized and actually um, do something. And I, I, I do agree. I do wonder, um, especially also for churches, like when, when complacency has to finish and a time for actual resistance um, is there. I, I, I do wonder about that a great deal these days. And, and I would say to Dr. Cottle, you know, get some of us into medical schools, get us mm. not as students, but bring us in to talk to <clears throat> to talk to medical students. We gave a talk at the law school for feminist scholars who were all opposed to this. And, you know, we had a bunch of medical students there who were just shocked to learn what the law actually says and how it how it operates. So we need to get these voices into the medical community as well um, so that young emerging doctors understand more about how this how this is going but on that note i'll pass it over to my colleagues and yeah I'd, I'd love to get you into the med school but we they they refuse to allow people to come that it's 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 quite interesting it's they they refuse to sanction uh, anybody who doesn't follow the for the most part anyone who doesn't follow the the, the party line we've tried 
Yeah, but so what speaks against Margaret and Isabel? What speaks against finding a forum where we bring together, like you and Isabel and med students, let's say at the Houston Center or in, into one room, and we have exactly that session, whether they like it or not. Well, it's we we have done that. It's yeah. just that you can't get it into the medical school itself. Right. And so, of the three hundred medical students who are in the uh, who are at University of BC, and each year um, maybe you'd get fifteen. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. My my husband and I have med students in our home for the last thirty years, once a week for a meal, and we talk about these issues and we try to strengthen them and do those things. But um, and we've even had events uh, that we've sponsored and tried to get people to come, but it just the having it at the medical school uh, is is almost impossible to to get uh, even even student led things. It's really hard to well, we'll to do, get that. We'll do it at the law school then. Okay. So All right. And on well, that note, thanks very much. Yeah, give me a call. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Okay, I think we should um, continue with questions, John. As Indeed, time's ticking and uh, Father Deacon Andrew or Neil, if you all want to speak to some of the um, uh, some of the actions that people can take at this at this stage, um, that you'd, you'd be welcome to do so as I sort through the questions. Sure, and I think I think last time when we presented, I I, I sort of said to the audience, "It's up to you. Uh, we need your voices out there, and it, and it has to be consistent." We saw, you know, uh, over the last eight months or so, very uh, active, uh, uh, lots of activity, being very concerned about uh, uh, mental health, the soul condition being you know eligible in in March of this year, so much so that I think it, it really gave the government pause to think to extend it for another year. And and I think that was done by a lot of disability groups, uh, a lot of uh, advocates fighting against the expansion of aid for mental health as a sole condition in, in, in itself. But now that's kind of died down and because, you know, we've got the one victory and then, you know, people take other areas and they look at other things and they don't really continue to, to, to focus on MAID in its entirety, track one and track two, and even the recommendations that just came out from the special committee. And and where they may not allow MAID uh, or talking about MAID medical uh, schools, I mean, it's going to come from the community and how that translates, like Andrew has said, what kind of civil disobedience that might be. You know, writing letters to governments, uh, sending emails, uh, they really are not that effective. Uh, I, I think you really have to, we have to polarize, uh, you know, everyday Canadians to, and, and, and really show them what's going on, give them basic understanding of what's happening, why it's happening, why persons with disabilities are electing to take made, why they're being offered made, why aren't they being provided those supports that uh, Dr. Connell spoke about, and what's the end result? And that has never really happened, and, and we haven't really come together. There's been groups of us that do this and, and different interested things. But I think largely Canadians are unaware of track two. Whenever we talk about MAID, we always talk about, you know, a grandparent who has stage four cancer, who uh, who doesn't want to suffer, and that's it. We don't look at track two. We don't look at the expansion to mature minors, not at end of life. We don't talk reasonably about it. that's directive uh, and what that means, you know, for a decision you make, uh, you know, prior, and are you the same person? All those questions that come up that should be asked, but we never do. Um, and my fear is that we're losing the momentum now, and I've talked to some of my colleagues, because I see more and more organizations and facilities offering um, webinars and information on MAID and how to access it from a process that I've ever seen before, uh, and less and less about organizations, individuals, and communities speaking against MAID. So I think we're, we're, we're on a downward slope in, in regards to advocating against MAID and the expansion of MAID and, and seeing an update of the pro-MAID groups moving forward. I will say that um, I was pleasantly surprised. I was contacted by uh, Willingdon Church here in Vancouver a couple months ago and asked if I would come and do a public lecture. Well, I, I do sort of an interactive thing about, you know, what do you have to believe in order to think this is a societal good and try to get people thinking about it rather than just giving them facts. And they had 500 people Mm -hmm. register to come, which in the past, it would have been fewer. And I do think that some of the stories about the veterans being offered made and uh, some of the other things that were out there uh, have, um, have, have really awakened people at a certain level 
but it's it's a it's the long game and um i think each of us can talk to the people around us and love the people around us and let them know i also think there's going to be a real need for spiritual care for people whose loved ones and relatives have chosen to to have medical termination when they've been very opposed to it um you know it's happened to me and my own family and i was I was completely shocked at um, the fact that it was done, and I was completely shocked uh, how I still feel uh, very, uh, uh, very hurt by very, uh, very wounded by the fact that this happened to my relatives. So, it, I think there's going to be a place where we're going to need some pastoral care for people who are who are really hurting because they're feeling complicit in in this uh in these decisions or that they were impotent to stop it <clears throat> i think i think it's also really important in terms of taking action to be uh innovative and to be entrepreneurial in healthcare. and there's a lot of good examples that we can find in other countries including the united states which is uh probably about i don't know margaret five to seven years maybe behind where we are at, at present um, but there's organizations and foundations such as the Christ uh, Medicus Foundation uh, and Curo Healthcare that they support, which um, is a way of offering an alternative form of healthcare and insurance. Uh, the problem is that in Canada, we've become so complacent and so comfortable with our socialized healthcare system that we figure that's the only option. And I think we have to challenge that. Um, and that, you know, when I think about civil disobedience, I think it's actually we have to have, be creatively civil disobedient and come up with new ways of offering care. And the Delta Hospice is a wonderful example of that. We need more of that. We need to multiply that. And we also need to engage those doctors who stand for pro-life health care uh, to begin to give them the courage and the resources <clears throat> they need to establish clinics, uh, to establish uh, clinics that are not just for Christians or people that are pro-life, but for anyone, anyone who wants that, that standard of care. And uh, that's going to require a lot of money. It's going to require a lot of money for court battles, uh, but we need to do it. And uh, that has to be, uh, in terms of pastoral care and pastoral support, I think um, there has to be communities of people that come around physicians uh, who want to do these types of things and give them the resources to do them and the courage to do them and to fight for them. Uh, because it's it's I think it's really quite critical now and uh, to be entrepreneurial to be innovative um, I think if we uh, spend more time in in that area and in, in terms of our our resources and our, our energy I think it'd be quite beneficial for our whole society on the on the question of entrepreneurialness uh, a quick question to Neil you can just bat this aside if you think it's a stupid question like the the independence of uh, indigenous territories could you could you simply do on your territories, say, we will have clinics, we'll staff them with people, we'll have them come in and they will, it's simply where, where government licensure, you know, where they can't control the physicians, they can't pull the licenses, we allow them to practice here, and this will be a, a made free zone. I, I don't think you could, you know, not, um say we're going to practice here and the, the no <clears throat> medical oversight body wouldn't have some jurisdiction over them right there there has to be some accountability uh and it's not a i mean if if it uh if it was a first nation community for example that had a strong economic development program had the resources to build such a facility as andrew was saying i mean you could certainly do that you could staff it the way you wanted to and you could say we're not going to provide this um i don't know if the government would start messing around coming and saying well no you have to refer within a first nations community particularly with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and those are interesting things we can look at. Unfortunately, we wouldn't have that many nations that actually would have those resources to build right. that facility and staff it. Um, and again, going back to the to the, all the reports, there's been no real tangible engagement, you know, and and, and, and how does how does made really translate into um, any Indigenous community? All are are very different and have different, uh, uh, you know, uh, practices, customs, uh, traditions. Um, mm -hmm. That's work that's never just been never been done. And we've heard, you know, uh, we've heard, uh, you know, testimony 
at the committee from the majority uh, of the indigenous witnesses that made is not something that we want. This is contrary to what we do. We've been fighting for hundreds and hundreds of years to keep people alive, <laughs> you know, to get the supports necessary, not to just say do this. And, and now, and for example, I was talking to to people from from uh, from uh, uh, my community where my clan is and I, and I was talking in healthcare and I said you know I want to get medical assistance to dying on your radar because we're looking at a primary primary care facility outside of uh, the community within the provincial jurisdiction and it was on nobody's radar and, and they were going to go look it up and I said this is something we need to be aware of because particularly under track two for mature minors you know and, and not knowing how because it, it, this is such a complex issue you know we're here for an hour and a half we need a uh, you know a week and a half to discuss all these things because if you if you examine all the testimony and you listen to the the government's expert witnesses on mental health of the soul condition saying well if a person has been accessing mental health services for 10 or 15 years um, and they haven't gotten any better as they consider it, then that should be considered to be an end of life condition. Well, okay, well, how do you translate that now to a mature minor, not an end of life dealing with mental illness? They're going to have to rescope everything out again. Everything changes. The answers keep changing. We have new accurates I've never heard of before. And they keep making new language to make it more, more palliative. And there's, there's, there's no line that, they're, line that they're not willing to skew from that'll justify the position. So when dealing with indigenous communities, I mean, we still haven't really seen that. We're going to be working hopefully with the AFN and looking at a resolution, but there's so much work that they haven't done, but yet pushed this forward. So there's so many unknowns, but short answer, uh, yes, uh, but there would always be some sort of oversight. So, you know, sure. Just, yeah. Okay. Thank you for giving that. Well, that. I, I do think too, that the, the government, uses its tentacles. And so um, if they decide, okay, yes, you're going to have this facility, but we're not going to license it. So you could say, okay, we don't have to have a license. I mean, even if the government puts no money in because of the regulation and all of those things that you have to have a licensed facility. So we say, okay, we're not gonna have a licensed facility. So then you say, uh, then no insurance company will give you disability or, um, or any other type of insurance for liability or anything like that. So it may well come to the place that we, where we were back in the 1800s, mm -hmm. where we take care of each other at home, yeah. and that we need to be training, um, uh, training the the communities, church communities, to care for each other, so that when my my father is ill or your aunt is ill or whatever that we we know that we come alongside each other and we help each other out with that. I don't think we're there yet. And um, I do agree that uh, Father Andrew's idea is a really good one that if, if we got things established now, then it's harder to uh, get rid of them. So that it, it, we're even seeing some protection for the the Catholic uh, hospital and hospice systems, uh, even though um, they're maybe not run by Catholics anymore, but there there's a little bit of conscience protection there. But but one of my friends just resigned from a Catholic hospital because um, she she was being bullied into participating in in MAID. So you know not not here, but it's mm. it's it's a complicated issue. Yeah, thank you, John. Do we have more questions? I'm just conscious of the time and. We do. Um, I think we could we could probably fit one more in, and then we could have a closing word from each of the panelists. Um, so it's to uh, Father Deacon Andrew, but I think there's a broader question here, um, just regarding um, the notion of conscience, uh, what role this plays. Um, so Father Deacon Andrew, um, has Canada gone too far in secularization and enthroning individual autonomy over all other values? Um, such that it cannot effectively proclaim the gospel message anymore. Um, and if that's not the case, um, what what gives you hope about the church's voice in this uh, in this matter? Sure, it's a very good question. I think I think it's important to recognize that we speak about Canada. What do we mean by Canada? Are we talking about the government, our institutions? Um, in some respect, if we're speaking about government and um, legislators, political parties, media, even the business class, 
It is not their role to proclaim the gospel. Individuals within those spheres certainly do and try to proclaim the gospel. But if we try to put our hope in, we put our trust in princes, as the psalmist says, we're going to be sorely disappointed. So the church must proclaim the gospel. Uh, but one of the major challenges I think we face in this country is that for far too long, and I'll say that in many cases, Catholics are the worst offenders, we have privatized our faith. Uh, so we have privatized our faith. We see it as something that we do in the comfortable pew, maybe in our homes. And we have not learned how to flex those muscles of faith in the public square. And to, and in many cases, we don't know what to say. We, even, even in our Christian communities, we have lost the language, the apologetic language that we can use that calls the broader society to recognize where we can, where we've really gone wrong. Um, we need that sort of prophetic voice where we can say, here's where we stand as Christians. And this is not unlike the first three centuries of the church. You know, the Romans were shocked that Christians didn't expose their children on the hillside. They were shocked that we treated our slaves with dignity, that women were treated with dignity. Um, so it's time for us again, those of us that are Christians, along with people of goodwill from all different traditions, to offer some uh, genuine surprises, I think, to surprise the society with a message that is hopeful, that is joyful, that is loving. And um, our institutions, um, we can influence them, but in order to do so, we have to speak out. We have to speak out coherently. We have to speak out courageously, but also be prepared to act. Uh, and to do that, we have to, as I said before, we have to have um, ideas. <laughs> we have to have ideas that are profoundly countercultural. We have to ideas that are cap have ideas that are captivating to people, where people are going to say, "Oh, that's a really interesting approach to healthcare," or "That's a really interesting approach to education." I like I like what these people are doing. Um, you know, we do live in a highly consumerist society. Let's make let's use that to our advantage. Let's adopt new approaches. Let's adopt new institutions. Uh, this is what what Christians have been doing for a very long time. But as I said, I think we've lost some of that muscle. We've gone a little bit flabby. Uh, because we are, even as Christians, we're quite statist in our mentality, you know, to, to Margaret's point. We expect the state to take care of us. Um, it's not necessarily the role of the family or the church community. Um, but as I said in a, in a piece that I wrote in Cardus's Convivium magazine some years ago, I asked the question, will the state hug me when I die? No, it won't. And that's also not its role. So we have to recognize whose role is it? And it's all of us in solidarity with one another and in, in community to do that. But we have to be smart about it. We have to have a new approach to it. Um, and we have enough people in this country who are committed to that type of model, uh, but we need to come together in a much more coherent fashion, not only to oppose what is currently in place, but at the same time, uh, exert our energy towards coming up with new models. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree. Um, John, is there any more questions or should we go to the end? I'm just looking at the time. It's about five to. Sure, I think we can, I think we can go ahead and, and wrap it up and move into concluding remarks from each of the panelists. Okay, maybe we'll start with um, Neil and then we'll go with Margaret and then uh, Andrew Bennett. Sure. Thanks, Jen. And, and thanks, Jen and, and John, for, for putting this on and for the support of this, and Andrew and, and Margaret for, for being on here as well. Um, very interesting uh, and informative conversation and dynamic, of course. Um, frustrating. Um, we're going to continue as an organization, you know, trying to, to stop this forward movement, uh, to try to get those new innovative ideas in place that Andrew spoke about and try to rally the, you know, communities to be communities again and to take this up as their action as their battle as well um, because if we don't 
we're just going to continue to see this escalating going forward and it will become the normalcy and there will be a day when we look back and we'll, we'll we, we won't you know uh, like uh dr connell said you know in the in, in uh, the Netherlands or whatever where they where they said that they had eliminated autism or or, or developmental disabilities you know is that who we are as uh, as peoples in Canada? Is that what Canada is becoming? Because we're we're on the fast track to be that way, right? We're the biggest provider of euthanasia in the world now, if I'm not mistaken, in such a short period of time. So it's uh, it's really hard, but I would encourage everybody who signed in into this call and that has listened today to be a part of the solution and to work with your governments who work, you know, at the local level, at the provincial, at the federal level, and express your your concern and your disdain and and, and, and ask for a halt of this until we can find different solutions to address other than that, because um, this is a road that we shouldn't be on, but we're we're traveling down it quite fast. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to the, my fellow panelists. It's been a very interesting discussion from lots of different perspectives tonight. And I would say that one of the things that we need to do is we really need to be people of prayer for those of us who uh, come from a faith background. Um, and someone asked me, what did I think could, what was there anything I thought could turn this around? And I really think it's revival, to be honest, that, that we are willing to um, confess our own our our own sins of omission and complacency, et cetera, and to go forward and in really caring for our neighbors and uh, seeing uh, folks who are are being targeted for this to rescue the perishing, as as it says. So uh, I I just like to leave you with two different images that a wonderful Catholic palliative care physician from the United Kingdom, Sheila Cassidy talks about. So she talks about Mary standing at the foot of the cross and how by the, the fact that she was bearing witness, she was not doing nothing. So for each person who's here tonight to bear witness at what is happening in our culture is not nothing. And Solzhenitsyn said, just your silence can be a, a, a rebellion. That if you're not saying, "Oh yes, I think this is wonderful," you're not going along with the roller with the, the snowball effect that we're having in our culture. So stand your ground, even when it's hard and it's not nothing. And the the other beautiful image I love is she talks about Mary, um, Martha's sister, using her dowry, her precious spikenard, and pouring the, this. Her, this expensive perfume over Jesus' feet. And it was what the way she termed it, it was an extravagance of caring. And the witness of her extravagance went up as uh, an aroma before her, everyone who was around her. And that we can do that in our culture too. I think that's a little bit what Father Andrew was saying that we develop these models and we, we, we go all out for it and we have this extravagance of caring. We pour ourselves out, the, you know, as Jesus did, we, he emptied himself. So we pour ourselves out um, in caring for each other. And this extravagance of caring goes up as a witness to our culture and makes them curious to, to want to do that. And um, I, I think that's one of the places that we can, we can, we can really make a difference. And, it's interesting, I've had a number of friends who have had people come to them knowing that they're opposed to medical termination and saying, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? So having your own understanding about this sorted out, knowing how to talk to somebody who's thinking about it, all of those types of things, knowing how to stand your ground, inviting people like me, I go to churches everywhere by Zoom and everything else, and I never charge anything to do that. So, you know, inviting, getting your, the, the people who are close to you, who are the kind of the low hanging fruit on this, getting them motivated and and educated about these issues is something that each of us can do. So thank you for participating tonight and getting yourselves educated as well. Thank you. Andrew? Well, again, let me just offer my thanks as well, Jens, to you and John and the team at the Houston Center for putting this on. These types of conversations, as Margaret has so eloquently stated, are so essential. And for all that have joined us, we have uh, had upwards of 70 participants. Please, God, next time it's 70,000 uh, who can hear 
the, this important discussion and be part of it. Um, again, I'll come back to the virtue of hope. We have to be able to offer people hope, hope in care, um, hope that they are that they are loved and that their dignity is valued um, and respected. And we have to uh, come alongside of medical students, of uh, young lawyers, um, of young clergy that are being formed, and to provide them with the language, the arguments, uh, and the and the, the spiritual support, the pastoral care to stand up. And um, we have to find ways uh, to get into the professional schools, the professional bodies to speak about this. It might take a long time. Uh, but those voices, as long as we uh, are effective and we have a clear apologetic to offer, I think we can be very, um, we can change things. Um, but to do so requires, again, not just words, but it requires concrete action and concrete. <laughs> we need to build things. Mm -hmm. And uh, to do so requires support. And it's going to require a rethinking of philanthropy in this country, not only when it comes to healthcare, but also, as I said, to schools to a variety of other things that are being undermined by um, a culture that that basically uh, seeks to destroy our humanity. Um, and so we as as people of goodwill, people of faith, uh, have to be the ones that offer that. Uh, it's a big task, uh, but we're up to it. We always have been. And I think that has to be uh, at the forefront of our minds at this time, not to dwell on where we are or where we were, but to deal with reality and confront it and come up with options for people. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that's beautifully put. I, I want to thank all of you. I mean, as we come to the end of the hour, I just want to say, I'm mean, just really uh, grateful that you that you came on and you kind of embody in a way my vision for the for the Houston Center to stand for a richer and fuller humanity and to do that precisely because of of our faith stance, right? I mean, God became human after all. And so all of humanity should be our concern. I think it's just beautiful to see how Neil speaks about a richer form of humanity, of spirit, and all these kind of things. Because one of the things that's really happening these days is, uh, is an atrophying or a diminishing of life. Like, we, we, like our sense of what life is, as becoming so technologized, becoming so clinical, so thin, so without mystery, so without spirit. Um, it's it's really um, it's really appalling in a way, and I'm I'm really grateful for all of you uh, for putting out a different vision in your different fields and disciplines. Um, all I could say is fight on, and I hope we can have another round of this kind of a thing to continue to raise awareness and install hope. So thank you all very very much.